Hello everyone, welcome to today's lecture video. Today we'll be covering chapter 9, which is titled Net Present Value and Other Investment Criteria. So our learning objectives for this chapter, first of all, show the reasons why the net present value criterion or the net present value method is the best way to evaluate proposed investments. Also discuss the payback rule and some of its shortcomings. Present the internal rate of return criterion and its strengths and weaknesses. Calculate the modified internal rate of return. And lastly, illustrate the profitability index and its relation to net present value. All of these learning objectives focus on how to evaluate capital budgeting projects. So we start things off with identifying what is capital budgeting. This term should not be unfamiliar to you. We discussed capital budgeting decisions in Chapter 1. In Chapter 1, we said that the financial manager is primarily concerned with answering three questions. First of all would be capital budgeting decisions, your long-term investments. Second was capital structure, what is your breakdown of long-term debt versus equity, so how do you fund these capital budgeting decisions, and then working capital management, which was your day-to-day -day operations. This chapter focuses on these capital budgeting decisions, your long-term investments. So capital budgeting is the process of deciding which capital investments the firm should make. So these are long-term in nature, and as a result, since they are long-term in nature, long-term decisions, they are very difficult to reverse once that decision has been made to move forward with the project. So what we will do in this chapter is present multiple methods and techniques that companies use when evaluating these different projects. So some examples of capital budgeting decisions would be a company planning to release a new tennis shoe. So maybe Nike is evaluating uh, the release of a new uh, running shoe. That is a capital budgeting decision. Um, or let's say you're getting ready to open your own ice cream store and you're choosing, uh, and well, first of all, you want to know would it make sense financially or would it make uh, ec uh, business sense to actually open that ice cream store, what you would do is, uh, is perform these capital budgeting techniques. So these are your long-term investments. What should be the goal of these decisions? Well, the goal of these decisions is similar to the goal of financial management, maximize shareholders' wealth. So what should be the goal of these decisions? We want to pick projects that add value to the firm, increase the value of the company, therefore maximizing shareholders' wealth. So when we are evaluating these projects, we want the benefits to outweigh the costs. Before we get into our different techniques, we first need to identify the different types of investment projects. So um, companies are evaluating multiple projects at the same time, and so when you're evaluating all of these projects um, intermittently, we need to understand what types of projects they are. Are they related or are they not? So first of all, we have independent projects. So with independent projects, the cash flows are unrelated. So if you're evaluating project A and project B and they are independent projects, the accepting or the rejecting of one project does not eliminate any other project from consideration. So if I'm evaluating A versus B, or I shouldn't say versus, I should say A or B, project A or project B, accepting A or rejecting A has no impact on accepting or rejecting B. The cash flows are unrelated. Now, on the other hand, we may have mutually exclusive projects. So with mutually exclusive projects, they can't both be true at the same time. So it's either A or B, or it's neither, but it cannot be A and B. Um, so for example, let's say you're trying to identify where to build a manufacturing plant, and you have locations A, B, or C, you can choose A, B, or C, but you cannot choose A and B, or B and C, or A and C. They are mutually exclusive. The acceptance of one rejects the other, uh, the other projects. And then last up would be contingent projects. So if I have contingent projects, A and B, B cannot be accepted unless A is first accepted. So the acceptance of one project, in this case project B, is contingent on the acceptance of the other project. So I'm not going to evaluate B by itself. What I would first do is evaluate A. If I move forward with A, then I could move forward with B. And this contingent project can either be mandatory or optional. If it's mandatory, then if I move forward with A, I have to do B. So let's say I'm building a power plant. Um, if I build this power plant, that's project A, then project B would be that I have to do pollution control. I don't do pollution control, project B, unless I do project A, but project B must be done if I choose to move forward with project A. Or contingent projects can be optional. So uh, let's say project A is building a specific type of computer. Project B is a specific program that can go on that computer. So if I build the computer project A, then I have the option of doing project B, but project B is contingent, first of all, on project A being accepted. So we'll go over some of these as we evaluate and, and use the different methods uh, discussed in this chapter. But that's the first thing is understanding what types of projects are am I evaluating. Are they unrelated, independent projects? Is it one or the other, meaning mutually exclusive, or are the projects contingent? 
Some key terms for this chapter. First of all, the main key term is cost of capital. So cost of capital is the minimum required return on a new investment. It's kind of like an opportunity cost. It's what you're giving up um, for uh, this project and what you could earn on another project of similar risk. Some other uh, phrases for cost of capital, you may also see required return, weighted average cost of capital. But what's uh, key about this cost of capital uh, terminology or this cost of capital value is that this is the rate that we'll use when we discount future cash flows. Okay, so this is, uh, this is basically the riskiness of the project. Um, so the, it, it can be thought of as the minimum required return on the new investment based on the risk level of this particular project. So what are the different methods that we'll be covering in this chapter? First of all, we have net present value. Then we have payback period. Then we will discuss the internal rate of return, the modified internal rate of return, and lastly, the profitability index. So these are the five different methods that we'll be utilizing. What we'll do is showcase how to value or, or utilize these methods, and then we'll discuss the strengths and weaknesses of each method um, as we progress through the different methods that we'll be covering. So first is net present value. What is net present value? Net present value is the difference between an investment's market value and its costs. So basically, a net present value is simply going to be calculate the present value of all the project's future cash flows and then subtract the present value of the costs. So basically what we're doing is we're evaluating all the different cash flows associated with the project, discounting them back to a present value and identifying what is the net or the total present value of all of these cash flows. This process is also called discounted cash flow valuation because we are taking future cash flows, discounting them back to a present value, and identifying what is the value of all these cash flows in one particular time period. Your steps for utilizing that present value is, first of all, determine the cost of the project. So what's it going to cost to launch this project? How much do I have to invest in inventory? How much do I have to invest in, um, in building the actual plant? So what are all the different costs to actually get this project up and running? Step two, then, is estimate the project's future cash flows over its expected life. So how much cash flows or what amount of cash flows are we generating throughout this investment time frame? Three, determine the riskiness of the project and the appropriate cost of capital. Then take all these cash flows and discount them back to a net present value, a total present value. And lastly, make a decision. Our decision is based on a value of zero. If the present value is greater than zero, that means that the present value of the cash inflows exceeds the present value of the costs. So this would be a project that would add value to the company. So you would accept this project. If you have a net present value that is less than zero, that means that the present value of the cash outflows, the costs, exceed the present value of the cash inflows. So this would actually uh, lower the value of the company. So you would reject a project that has a net present value less than zero. And if a project has a net present value that is equal to zero, we say that we are indifferent. Indifferent because it neither adds value to the company nor decreases value of the company. But it is important to understand that all of our cash flows are based on estimates. So if you do get a net present value that's equal to zero, that means it's borderline between adding value or losing value. And it might be one of those types of projects that you need to dive a little bit further into your estimations to see exactly how accurate your cash flow projections are. Now, what's key to point out here um, in this chapter is in this chapter, we are going to be given the costs. We will be given the future cash flows. We will be given the riskiness. Um, so all of these values are going to be uh, provided to us. And then in upcoming chapters, we will actually take project scenarios and determine the costs determine the cash flows, and then uh, concluding our, our semester is we'll talk about the riskiness of different projects. So right now, they're giving us all of the inputs, and as we progress through these next couple of chapters, you'll find out that the next couple of chapters actually focus on how do I get these different inputs that I'm utilizing. So let's do an example with net present value. Emporia Mills is evaluating two he heating systems. The costs and the projected energy savings are given in the following table. The firm uses 11.5% to discount such project cash flows. So this is our what is called the cost of capital, the minimum required rate of return that the project must earn in order to be accepted. And it's also based on the riskiness of the project. In this case, the riskiness being uh, in, uh, installing two new heating systems, which system should be chosen. So if we go back just to kind of apply the terminologies of the different types of projects, we have two heating systems and we're only choosing one, right? So if I'm only choosing one, I'm not going to choose both system 100 and system 200. This is a situation where we have mutually exclusive projects. Okay, so choosing one would eliminate the other. I will choose either system 100 or system 200, but I will not be choosing both. 
And so what we are going to be doing is calculating the net present value. So we are going to take all of these cash flows and list them in time period zero and solve for the net or the total present value. Notice that I did not draw an arrow on the initial cost in year zero because that is a cost that is already in present value terms. Now you could do each of these cash flows uh, separately and then sum them all together in present value terms. So for example, this is already in present value. We would take this 275, 250 and list it as our future value and discount it one period and solve for the present value using the IY of 11.5%, doing the same thing for the 512, 450, except discounting it back two periods, and then so forth for the remaining cash flows. Or you can think back to chapter six when we solve for the present value of multiple cash flows of, the, of different amounts. And so this is utilizing the cash flow function on our financial calculators. So since we've already discussed the different steps, I'm not going to go through a step-by-step -step process of how you input these into your cash flow register. If you do need additional guidance, please look back at the Chapter 6 PowerPoint. But the first thing that you will do is you will hit the CF function on your financial calculator that brings up your cash flows and you always want to clear your cash flow register so you hit second clear work down at the bottom left corner and you've cleared out everything that's in that cash flow register you should see a cf0 cf0 represents the cash flow that is already in time period zero so in this case for system 100 it is negative one million seven hundred fifty thousand i hit enter and then i push the down arrow and i see c01 C01 represents the cash flow that needs to be discounted back one period. So in this case, it is 275, 250. I hit enter. I push the down arrow. I see F01. F stands for the frequency of that cash flow. That cash flow only occurs once, so I leave it at one. I hit enter and I push down. CO2 represents the cash flow that needs to be discounted back two periods. So I get 512, 450. I push enter, I push down, I see F02, F02 should stay 1 since that cash flow only occurs once. I push enter, I push down, I see C03, C03 would be the 649, 649,000. I hit enter, I push down, I see F03, F03 stays at 1. I hit enter, I push down, I see C04, C04 is 875,000. I hit enter, I push down, F04 stays at 1. I always like to just push down and down and down again, uh, so three times, and I should get back to CF0 if I don't have any cash flow stored uh, from previous problems. And then the next thing that you're going to do is you're going to hit the NPV button. When you hit the NPV button, you see an I. That I represents your cost of capital, your discount rate. So I'm going to type in 11.5, 11.5% is what the, the rate is that I'll be using uh, to discount these cash flows. I hit the enter button. I push down and it should say NPV. Then you hit compute and it's going to compute the net present value. So for system 100, the net present value is a negative 56,000. I'm going to change where I'm writing this so you have a better view of it. The net present value here for system 100 is equal to a negative $56,637.01. So is this an actual negative value? We've been dealing a lot with our financial calculator where we get a negative and then all of a sudden we just say, well, that's a positive. It's just one of them always has to be negative. In this case, when I have a negative net present value, this is indeed a negative value. What this is saying is that the cash outflows, the negative $1.75 million initial cost, exceed the present value of the cash inflows by over $56,000. So if I were to move forward and install System 100, the costs exceed the savings by over $56,000, so it would actually reduce the value of the company. So this would be a project that we would reject. This is decreasing the value of the company due to the negative net present value. The costs exceed the, the cost savings. So this is a project that would be rejected. Let's take a look at system 200. I'll go a little bit more quickly through the inputs here. CF0 is simply going to be that negative 1,735,000. CO1 is the 750,000. CO2 is equal to 612,500. CO3 is equal to 550, 100, and then CO4 is equal to 384, 300. And once again, you should kind of uh, verify these answers by working along with the problem um, uh, on your own. When I hit NPV, I put in the I of 11.5%. I hit enter, I push down, I see NPV there, I hit compute, and I get an en a net present value for system 200 of $75,797.43.
So is this a project that you would move forward with? Yes, you would accept system 200. The cost savings or the cash inflows, the benefits of the project exceed the cost by over $75,000. And that is net present value. Okay, so here we were evaluating two projects. They were mutually exclusive. You would accept only one or the other, but not both. In the event that they were both positive, then you would choose the one with the highest net present value. If they were both negative, you would simply reject both of the projects. Uh, but since I can only choose one, and in this case, we only have one that has a positive net present value, system 200 would be the one that you would move forward with. So calculating net present value, some tips, always draw a timeline. I know I didn't draw one there. We had them listed out um, in a chart, but most mistakes occur by not identifying a cash flow or getting a cash flow in the wrong time period or assigning the wrong sign to a cash flow. So a cash outflow not being a negative or a cash inflow not being a positive. Let's take a look at another example. Suppose that we have a project that requires an initial cash expenditure of $925,000. So that's our initial cost in year zero for equipment and additional cash outlay of $37,500 in year one. So this one actually has two years of cash outflows. And then we will generate cash inflows of $289,000 for years two through six. Our discount rate or our cost of capital is 12.5%. What is the net present value? Should we accept this project? Well, let's say I'm struggling with this one. What I would recommend doing is drawing a timeline. So here in year zero, the initial cost is a negative $925,000. So to get this project started, I need to, I need to pay out or ex, uh, have an expense of $925,000 just to get the project launched. Then in year one, I have a cash outflow of negative $37,500. So I have two cash outflows represented by the negative value, uh, which is key in our net present value calculations. Then in years two, three, four, five, and six, I'm generating cash inflows of 289000 And what I would like to do is calculate the net present value, which is taking all of these cash flows, discounting them back to a present value. Notice that I don't do anything with the 925 because it's already in present value terms. Get them all in their present value terms and calculate the net or the total present value using a discount rate of 12.5%. Now, it would take much longer time to do this using uh, doing each individual cash flow separately. So once again, we'll be using our cash flow register. I hit CF. Make sure that you clear your cash flow function. So now I have CF0 being the initial cash outflow, which is a negative 925,000. I hit push enter, I push down, I see C01. What is the cash flow that needs to be discounted back one period? It is a negative 37,500. That negative is key. When I push enter and push down, F01 represents the frequency of that cash flow. That cash flow only occurs once, so I keep it at one. I hit enter, I push down, and I see C02. C02 is 289,000. And when I push enter and push down, now I see F02, the frequency of that second or of that third cash flow here. Well, how many times does that 289,000 uh, cash flow occur consecutively? We have one, two, three, four, five different cash flows of the same amount occurring consecutively. So here I can change the frequency of this second cash flow that I have input to a five for F02. Now, if you don't feel comfortable making that change, you, you could just keep that at one and have CO3 be 289,000, CO4 be 289,000, CO5 be 289,000, and CO6 be 289,000. You'll get the same answer, but to save a little bit of time, since the cash flows do occur um, the, uh, the same amount for consecutive periods, I can actually change that frequency value now. So then I hit NPV and I type in my I, my I is 12.5%, I hit enter, I push down, and then I compute the net present value, and I get a net present value of a negative $43,662.89. Hopefully you understand that since this is a negative value, the cash outflows exceed the cash inflows by that amount. Would you accept this project? No, you would reject this project because it has a negative net present value. So some concluding comments on net present value. Um, again, if the net present value is greater than zero, we accept the project. If it is less than zero, we reject the project. Uh, the advantages, uh, if it's net present value equal to zero, we say we are, uh, we are indifferent. Um, but key advantages of net present value is it does use discounted cash flow valuation, so it does uh, incorporate time value of money. It is also a direct measure of how much a capital project will increase the value of the firm, so it gives you a direct uh, value amount, and as a result, it is also consistent with the goal of maximizing shareholder wealth. 
The key disadvantage is that it is difficult to understand without an accounting and finance background. But as we go and we move into the different methods that are utilized, when in doubt, if you are evaluating um, mutually exclusive projects or if you can only use one method um, in your valuation, net present value is the preferred method because of the fact that it does utilize time value money and it is consistent with the goal of maximizing shareholders' wealth. So moving on to the next type of capital budgeting method, which is the payback period. The payback period is the amount of time required for an investment to generate cash flow sufficient to recover its initial cost. The equation says that you take, sometimes you'll see this is just PB, your payback is equal to your full number of years before cost recovery, and then rarely are you going to have cost recovery occur on a fixed year, so a, a whole year, like at, at the end of two years or at the end of three years. So what we need to do is cal calculate the partial year, and to calculate the partial year, you take the remaining cost to recover, and you divide it by the cash flow during that particular year. Now, it might seem a little confusing at first with this equation, but once we do a couple examples, hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and jump into the evaluation of two projects. Here we have project L and we have project S. Both of them have a re, uh, an initial cash outflow to start the project of $100. Uh, project L has a cash flow of $10 in year one, $60 in year two, $80 in year three. And then with project S, they have a $70 cash flow in year one, 50 in year two, and 20 in year three. How long does it take each of these projects to recoup that initial $100 investment? Let's take a look at L first. So what you're going to do when you're utilizing the payback period is you make a cumulative line, which showcases how much you are still in the hole after each individual year. So I start off in the hole $100, the cost of the project. In this first year, I generate a cash inflow of $10. So at the end of the first year, I'm still in the hole $90. In year two, I generate a cash inflow of $60. So I'm still in the hole 30. And somewhere then between year two and three is when I actually recoup my investment. So what we need to do is we know it's going to take a full two years. If I'm in the whole 30 and I generate 80 in the next year, what portion of that second year did it take to recover that uh, my, my total investment? So the payback equation says full years before cost recovery, in this case, two full years, then you take – sorry about that. Then you take the amount that you are still in the hole, which in this case was $30. You divide it by that next year's cash flow, which was 80, and that gives you your partial year. So 30 divided by 80 is 0.375. So two years plus uh, 0.375 uh, of a year would give you a total payback period of 2.375 years. Um, you can go ahead and start working through Project S. Um, on your own if you would like, but we'll, we'll cover that here in the PowerPoint as well. Looking at Project S, once again, we are in the hole 100. We bring in a cash flow of $70 in that first year, so we're still in the hole 30. You can see that the next year's cash flow is 50, so we know that somewhere between year 1 and 2 is when we recoup our investment. So it's one full year. We still have 30 to, uh, to recoup going into that second year. The second year's cash flow is 50. We can see then that the payback period is 1.6 years. Um, so what you would have is you'd have some criterion uh, saying that uh, the company will not take on any projects that have their money locked in uh, or locked up for greater than two years, for example. Like let's say the company is evaluating all their projects and their payback period says that they must recoup all of their investments in under two years. In this case, Project L would be rejected because it took more than two years. It took 2.375 years to, uh, to recoup your investment, whereas Project S would be accepted because uh, the money is only tied up for 1.6 years. So what are the strengths and weaknesses of this payback period? Strengths would be that it does provide an indication of a project's risk and liquidity. So it does uh, deal with how quickly you're able to recoup that investment. And it's also pretty easy to calculate and understand. The main weaknesses are that it ignores time value of money. So we were using cash flow amounts in the future as opposed to identifying what their actual present value amounts were. Um, so this ignores time value of money. There is also another method called the discounted payback. We won't be utilizing that in this course, but it is something you might see out in the workforce where they, instead of uh, using cash flow amounts in the future, what they would first do is list all of those cash flows in their present value amounts and then calculate the, the payback in the same manner. And that is called the discounted payback period. 
And then another weakness is that it, it, it ignores cash flows occurring after the payback period. So let's say in that first example with Project L, uh, let's say I believe it was negative 100 in year one, and then it was negative, or it had a cash flow of $10 in year two, $60 in year three. Let's say we can see here that we're in the whole 100. We only generate 70 cash inflow at the end of the uh, second year. But let's say our payback period was only two years. It would actually uh, eliminate or not even consider or ignore this third year's cash flow. What if it was a substantial cash flow? So um, with the time or with the payback period, it is a relatively easy, straightforward calculation. But the key weaknesses is that it does ignore time value of money and it does ignore any cash flows that occur after that set payback period that the company has identified. So the next method that we'll be evaluating is the internal rate of return. So the internal rate of return is the discount rate that makes the net present value of an investment zero. So as you can see here, we have our initial cost, CF0, and then we have our cash inflows. What we're looking for with the internal rate of return is what is the rate of return that would make the pr present value of these future cash inflows equal to the present value of the costs. So as I mentioned, the IRR is the discount rate that forces present value of the inflows equal to the present value of the cost. This is the same thing as forcing net present value to zero. So we're just looking at this net present value in a different, um, in a different point of view, whereas instead of solving for the net present value given a discount rate, here we're forcing net present value equal to zero and solving for the discount rate. So here is your equation for net present value. Net present value is taking each cash flow, discounting it back the appropriate number of periods, and then summing all of those cash flows together. So you're solving for the net or the total present value. With the internal rate of return, what we do is we force this net present value equal to zero, and now we're solving for the discount rate that would make that net present value actually equal to zero. So as you can see here, it's the same equation, but now we're solving for this discount rate. So calculating IRR, let's look at an example. So Great Flights is an aviation firm, and they are exploring the purchase of three aircrafts that cost a total amount of $161 million. Now the cash flows from leasing these aircrafts is expected to build slowly as shown in the following table. What is the internal rate of return on this project? The required rate of return or the cost of capital is 15%. So what we do here is instead of uh, using that required rate of return of 15% and calculating a net present value, what we'll do when solving for the IRR is we solve for the discount rate that forces net present value equal to zero, and we compare it to that required rate of return. Now, if you are going to be doing this algebraically, this would be a guess and check method, so it could be time consuming and quite uh, frustrating. Or what's nice about these is that we can actually still use our financial calculator, and it will solve for the internal rate of return rather straightforward. So once again, the first thing that we are going to be doing is inputting our cash flows into our cash flow function. So CF, I hit the CF function, I clear all the cash flows from the previous problem. CF0 represents the initial cost or the cash flow that's already in present value terms, or in time period zero, I should say. And in this case, it is a negative 161 million. So this was given as the cost of the project, the negative 161 million. CO1 represents the cash flow in time period one. So CO1 is equal to 23,500,000, and what's nice about this one, or not necessarily what's nice, but what we can do on this one is that this cash flow occurs in years 1, 2, 3, and 4. So the frequency of this cash flow, if it occurs in years 1, 2, 3, and 4, the frequency is 4. So I can change the frequency uh, input, the F input, on my financial calculator. When I hit enter and push down, it's going to say C02, but the calculator knows that since I changed the frequency to 4, this next cash flow is the cash flow that occurs in period 5. The cash flow that occurs in period 5 also occurs in years 6 and 7, so I can actually change the frequency of this second cash flow to a 3, understanding that it occurs in years 5, 6, and 7, so three consecutive time periods. I push enter, I push down, then C03, the calculator knows is not just the third year's cash flow, it is four years plus seven or plus three years, so this is actually the eighth year's cash flow, which is 80 million, and once again, it occurs in years eight, nine, and 10, so I can change the frequency of this third year's cash flow to three also. Now, once again, if you do not feel comfortable changing that F value, you would just have CO1, CO2, CO3, CO4, all being 23,500,000, CO5, CO6, CO7 would be 72 million, and then CO8, CO9, CO10 would all be the 80 million. So now, 
what you're going to do is you are going to find the IRR function on your financial calculator. So as I go to the financial uh, app that I have here, um, just to open it up so you can see exactly where it is, your IRR button is right next to the NPV button. So what you'll do is you'll hit the IRR button, and this is even easier than that present value. You're just going to hit the compute button up in the top left corner, and that's going to compute the... Uh, it's going to compute the internal rate of return. So when I hit IRR and then hit compute, I get an internal rate of return that is equal to 22.65%. So what this is saying is that if I use a 22.65% discount rate and solve for net present value, my net present value would be uh, equal to zero. So what you do with the internal rate of return is you compare this internal rate of return versus your required rate of return, and if your IRR is greater than your required rate, then this project adds value to the company. So in this case, our IRR is greater than the required rate of return, so this would be a project that would be accepted based on the internal rate criterion. So let's look at this rationale once again that I kind of just verbally stated. If your internal rate of return is greater than your cost of capital, then the project's rate of return is greater than its cost, meaning that there's some return that is left over to boost stockholders' returns. So for example, if a project has a cost of capital or a required rate of return of 10% and an internal rate of return on the project is 15%, this project would add some extra return to shareholders. So this would be a type of project that would be accepted based on the internal rate of return criteria. Now, you might think that when you're evaluating two projects, that if you're using NPV or IRR, you'll always get the same answer because they utilize the same equation, just solving for different uh, portions of the equation. However, that is not always the case. Now, uh, before we get into sometimes when it's not the case where they'll always agree, when will the internal rate of return and net present value methods agree? Well, the two methods will always agree, meaning they tell you the same accept a project or the same reject a project when you are evaluating independent projects. So remember, projects where the cash flows are unrelated, the acceptance of one project has no bearing on the acceptance or the rejectance of another project, and that the cash flows are conventional. Conventional cash flows occur when you have a cash outflow followed by one or more cash inflows, meaning that there is only one sign change from a cash outflow to a cash inflow. That is what is called a conventional cash flow pattern. A good way to visualize the relationship between internal rate of return and net present value is to graph your net present value as a function of the discount rate. So let's say I have cash flows. The cash flows are not provided here, but what they've done is they've calculated the net present value using different discount rates. And if I graph these together on a chart, you can see that as your discount rate increases, the present value of future cash flows gets smaller, so our net present value actually goes down, and then vice versa, if your discount rate decreases, the present value of your future cash flows goes up. So remember that, dis that inverse relationship. Um, but this point where your net present value is equal to zero is actually your internal rate of return. So both of these would be giving you the same um, the same rationale for accepting or rejecting a project. So if you end up having a, a discount rate of 10%, your required rate of return is 10%, not only do you have a positive net present value, but the internal rate of return would also be greater than that 10%. So it's both giving you the same accept, uh, the, the same accept decision. Same with if we were using a 20% discount rate, we'd have a negative net present value and our internal rate of return is less than that required rate of return. So both of them are giving you a a rejection uh, sign. So the two methods will always agree if you're evaluating independent projects and those projects have conventional cash flows. The net present value and internal rate of return, of return methods may disagree if you have unconventional cash flows. So unconventional cash flows are where you have a cash outflow followed by a cash inflow, one or more cash inflows, and then another cash outflow. So you have more than one sign change in your cash flows. This is called an unconventional unconventional cash flow pattern and an example of this now again they're not giving you the actual cash flows but they're solving for the net present value um, if i look at this unconventional cash flow pattern on that net present value graph you can see that we actually end up getting two internal rates of return um, so the number of internal rate of return solutions is actually equal to the number of cash flow uh, sign changes but when you have an unconventional cash flow pattern you should not use the internal rate of return method with unconventional cash flows. 
So it will give you multiple answers and they are not correct answers. Uh, so the key to understand is if you do have this unconventional cash flow pattern, so more than one sign change in your cash flows, you should not use the internal rate of return method. Additionally, your net present value and internal rate of return methods might disagree if you have mutually exclusive projects. So think back to mutually exclusive projects. Remember, you're evaluating two projects. You can choose one or the other, but you cannot choose both. So let's just showcase how they could actually disagree um, when you have mutually exclusive projects. So let's look at project A and project B. Project A, we have an initial cash outflow of $500, a cash inflow of $325 in year one, and $325 in year two. Let's solve for the internal rate of return and the net present value. So once again, project A, we're just going to put these into our cash flow function. CF0 is that initial cost. CO1 is $325. I could change the frequency of this cash flow to two since it occurs two consecutive periods. When I solve for the internal rate of return, I get a value of 19.43%. Now, since the cash flows are already input into my cash flow function, let's go ahead and solve for the net present value. So hit the NPV button, type in 10 as your discount rate. That's our required uh, rate of return. When I solve for the net present value, I get $64.05. Now, let's do the same thing for project B. Changing our CF0 to negative 400. CO1 is 325. CO2 is 200. When I solve for the internal rate of return of project B, I get a value of 22.17%. And when I solve for the net present value, I get a, product, a value of 60.74. So if I were evaluating these two projects and only using the internal rate of return method, which one has the greater internal rate of return? You would choose project B. But then if I was only using the net present value method, which project would I choose? You would choose the one with the higher net present value, so I would choose project A. So they are disagreeing as to which project I should choose if I can only choose one, if they are mutually exclusive. So when in doubt... Which project should you choose? We choose the one with the higher net present value, so we would be choosing project A. If I have mutually exclusive projects, um, you choose the one with the higher net present value. Okay, so uh, net present value and the internal rate of return methods will disagree if you have unconventional cash flows, meaning that you cannot use the internal rate of return method, or if you have mutually exclusive projects, in which case you should always choose the one with the higher net present value. That's the one that would increase the value of the company the most. That is the one that is most consistent with our goal of maximizing shareholders' wealth. You could also solve for the crossover point between two projects that are mutually exclusive. I just wanted to showcase this to you here. We're not going to go into solving for this crossover point. But there is a point here in which Project A, if the discount rate is less than that crossover point, Project A is actually a higher net present value versus Project B. And then once we exceed that crossover point, then Project B becomes the higher net present value. So you, when you're evaluating two projects with a... Uh, that are mutually exclusive, you can actually solve for that crossover point between the two um, and then look at the discount rate and compare it to, to identify which project would actually have the higher net present value and should be accepted uh, due to the fact that it would increase the value of the company the most. So final comments on internal rate of return. If your internal rate of return is greater than your cost of capital, you would accept it. If it's less than your cost of capital, you would reject it. Once again, if it's equal, you would be indifferent. Now, your key advantages here is that it is, uh, once again, intuitively easy to understand, just comparing different rates, and it is based on discounted cash flow uh, techniques, so discounted cash flow valuation using time value of money. However, key disadvantages, if you, if you have non-conventional cash flows, the internal rate of return approach can yield no usable answer or multiple answers, so we cannot use it with these uh, non-conventional or unconventional cash flows. Um, a lower internal rate of return can be better if a cash inflow is followed by cash outflows. And then with mutually exclusive projects, the IRR can lead to incorrect investment decisions. And the internal rate of return calculations assumes that cash flows are reinvested at that internal rate of return method. And so what we can do here is we can actually have a modified internal rate of return calculation that will help solve or answer or, or provide solutions to many of these key disadvantages. And that's what we'll move into next. So the modified internal rate of return is a way that we can eliminate the multiple IRRs with unconventional cash flows and also uh, focus on, a, on, on correcting that assumption that future cash flows are reinvested at that internal rate of return. 
So as I mentioned, to address some of the problems that arise from using the internal rate of return, it is often proposed that a modified version is used, and there are three different methods that are used to calculate this modified internal rate of return. First is the discounting approach. So with the discounting approach, what you do is you discount all your negative cash flows to time period zero, and you add them to the initial cost, and then you calculate the IRR. So instead of having unconventional cash flows, you get all of your cash outflows listed in time period zero, which then would give you a conventional cash flow pattern in which you could calculate the IRR like we did previously. The other method is the reinvestment approach, and we will be using this approach. With the reinvestment approach, you're going to take all cash flows after time period zero, so all cash flows after time period zero, and we are going to reinvest all these cash flows to a future value. And so then what we will have is our initial cost, which is the only cash flow that's in present value, and we have one cash flow at future value, and we can solve for the IY to go from that initial cost in present value terms to the future value. So basically what we're doing is uh, eliminating the unconventional cash flows by listing all of our uh, cash flows as a single cash flow at the end, um, and this also solves for the reinvestment rate assumption where we will be using the reinvestment rate provided to solve for that future value as opposed to, re to assuming that we're reinvesting the cash flows at whatever that internal rate of return is on the project. The third method is a combination approach, which says you take all cash outflows and discount them to a present value, take all cash inflows, compound them to a future value, and then solve for the IY between the two. So as I mentioned, there are three different approaches. We are going to be utilizing the reinvestment approach. So let's just take a look at an example. So Billy Jean is evaluating a project with the following cash flows. As soon as you see these cash flows, you should realize that you cannot use the internal rate of return, right? So the uh, you cannot use the internal rate of return because we have a cash outflow followed by cash inflows, and then we have another cash outflow at the end. So what we have here is an unconventional cash flow pattern. So we are unable to um, we are unable to use the internal rate of return method. Now, uh, the company uses an interest rate of 11% on all of its projects, and we are going to calculate the modified internal rate of return using the reinvestment approach. So let's just put these on a timeline so we can better visually see when the cash flows occur. In year zero, we have a cash outflow of 23,700. In year one, a cash inflow of 8,600. In year two, a cash inflow of 10,210. In year three, a cash inflow of 9,220. In year four, a cash inflow of 8,115. And then in year five, a cash outflow of negative 4,770. With the reinvestment approach, what we are going to do is take all of these cash flows and reinvest them to their future value. And so then I'll just have one cash outflow in time period zero, and then one cash inflow at the end of the project. And we will solve for the IY between them using an N of five. Okay, so we will just be getting two lump sum cash flows and solving for the IY, utilizing our time value money calculations that we learned in chapter five. So think back to chapter, to chapter six, though, when we saw for the future value of multiple cash flows of different amounts. I could do each one of these separately. So for example, I could take that 8,600 as my present value, compound it four periods to the end and solve for the future value using the IY of 11%. And then do the same thing with the second year's cash flow, except compounding at three periods. Same thing with the third year's cash flow, compounding at two periods, and so forth. I would do nothing with this fifth year's cash flow because it's already in future value terms. Or what we solved, or what we did in uh, chapter six, is to solve for the future value of multiple cash flows. We first get them all in their present value form. So first solve for NPV, and then compound that one lump sum. So that's what we'll be doing here. So to solve for the NPV, we are only focusing on the cash flows after time period zero, so these five years of cash flows, and we want to list them all in the same time period. Uh, and the easiest way that I recommend is to solve for the NPV using your financial calculators. So CF0 is zero because we're only focusing on the cash flows after time period zero uh, for this part of the, of the calculations. CO1 then is the 8,600. CO2 is the 10,210. CO3 is the 9,220, CO4 is the 8,115, and then CO5 is the negative 4,770. I'm going to hit the NPV button and type in my I, which is 11%. And then when I solve for the net present value, I get a net present value that is equal to 25,000. 
$290, and I'm going to keep this at 0.8. 363 since this is an intermediate calculation. So this is what the present value is, but we need to find the future value. So now that I just have one lump sum cash flow, that lump sum is my present value, $25,290.8363. I'm going to solve for the future value of this lump sum, where I'm going to compound at five periods an IY of 11%, and I do not have a constant cash flow or a payment. So then when I solve for the net present value, I get an amount that is equal to $42,616.53. So what I've done here, this value is the future value of all the cash flows after time period zero. So now all I have is an initial cash outflow of $23,700. Then I have a future value amount of $42,616.53, and I'm going to solve for the IY between these two cash flows, where this is my present value, this is my future value, the periods are five, I do not have a payment, and I solve for the IY here, and I get a modified internal rate of return of 12.45%. So using this, uh, this modified uh, reinvestment approach, I've solved for a modified internal rate of return of 12.45%. It does exceed my 11% relevant or cost of capital for this problem. So using the modified internal rate of return, I would accept this project because the modified internal rate of return is, is greater than our cost of capital. And once again, we were not able to simply solve for the internal rate of return initially because we had an unconventional cash flow pattern. So that is the modified internal rate of return. Um, it's modifying the cash flows so that you can still calculate a rate of return in particular. Uh, with the reinvestment approach, it, it, it rectifies both the unconventional cash flow issue uh, with solving for the internal rate of return, and it also uh, rectifies the reinvestment rate assumption. So the last method that we will be covering here is the profitability index. So with the profitability index, it is the present value of an investment's future cash flows divided by its initial cost. It's also called the benefit cost ratio. Uh, basically what the profitability index measures is what is your bang for your buck? So what is the value that is created in present value cash inflows per dollar that is, uh, that is paid for the project? So this profitability index is compared to the value of one. If it's greater than one, then it would have a positive net present value, uh, meaning that the present value of the cash inflows exceed the present value of the cost. Less than one, you'd have a negative net present value. Um, if it was equal to one, that means the present value of the cash inflows equal the present value of the cost. You would have a net present value of zero. Once again, you'd be in, indifferent. So let's say when you calculate the profitability index, you get 1.3. What this means is that per dollar invested, so essentially this is 1.3 divided by 1. Uh, so you're generating a cash inflow of $1.30 per dollar that you're spending. Um, so per dollar invested, there is $1.30 um, in value, or you can say $0.30 cents in net present value results. Um, so let's take a look at an example here. So consider an investment that costs $15,000 and has the following three cash flows. Uh, what is the profitability index? So the profitability index says that you take the present value of the cash flows from time period one to the end of the project, and you divide it by the present value of the cost. So in this case, the present value of the cost is $15,000. And we need to solve for the present value of the cash flows from time period one on, which is simply solving for the net present value. So with net present value, cash flow in time period zero is going to be zero because we're only focused on cash flows after time period zero. So starting at year one, CO1 is 7,500, CO2 is 8,250, and then CO3 is 8,000. And when I hit the NPV button, I type in an I of 11%. And when I solve for the net present value, I get a net present value of 1,000, sorry, 19,000. $302 and a little over 17 cents. This is the present value of the cash flows from time period one on. That is my numerator in the profitability index equation. And so I divide the present value of the cash inflows divided by the present value of the cost, and I get a profitability index of 1.2868. So for every dollar I spend, I'm generating $1.28 in, in, in positive cash inflows. So would you accept this project? Yes, you would accept this project because your profitability index is greater than, I should not say zero, is greater than one. 
So that is our final method uh, for evaluating capital budgeting projects. Just a quick recap on profitability index. The advantages is that it is closely related to net present value, generally leading to identical decisions. So once again, it considers all cash flows and it also considers time value of money. It's easy to understand and communicate and it is useful in capital rationing. So if you have limited funds, um, and you can only choose you, you, the profitability index helps you identify those projects that generate the greatest bang for your buck. Disadvantages is it may lead to incorrect decisions. Uh, once again, when you're comparing mutually exclusive projects. So once again, when in doubt with mutually exclusive project projects, you use the net present value criterion as that is the one that is consistent with maximizing shareholders' wealth. Uh, just like with profitability or just like with the internal rate of return, the profitability index can lead to incorrect decisions if you're evaluating two projects that are mutually exclusive, meaning that you can only choose one or the other. So what is actually used out in practice here? Um, so as you can see, um, over time, the different methods are all being utilized, but primarily the ones that are being utilized the most are either net present value or internal rate of return. Um, so you can kind of evaluate this, uh, ev evaluate this chart here a little bit more in detail, but you can see that the profitability index has decreased in usage over the years. Um, we did not cover the average accounting rate of return, but your internal rate of return and your net present values have increased over the years. Um, so those are the two methods that are most commonly used in the, in the, com or in the, the methods that you will most likely see out in the workforce. So that concludes uh, Chapter 9, so net present value, another investment criterion, uh, just simply the different ways that you can evaluate these capital budgeting projects. As I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, um, in this particular chapter, they provided you all the inputs. What you can look forward to in upcoming chapters is actually finding out the inputs uh, for these different uh, projects under consideration, and then we'll continue to utilize these methods in our evaluation of the projects. Uh, so it is important to have as thorough of an understanding of these methods as possible. So uh, thank you for your time here today. If you have any questions about anything, don't hesitate to reach out, and I'll talk to you all soon. Thank you.